welcome to the eight I notes biology September revision lecture I hope you guys are all doing really well I hope you are having a lovely <coughs> sorry I've just got a bit of a cough um, but I hope you're having a lovely holiday so far um, or as lovely as it can be with all the HSC prep happening so I hope everything's going really really well welcome to the lecture it's so good to have you guys here um so a very warm welcome from all of us here at ATA notes so before we begin just quickly introduce you to some of the amazing resources that we have to offer here um and that includes our study notes so if you're now you know looking for some last minute study notes to add to your collection um our website's a great place to check it out so we've got free study notes um, that you know students post their own study notes and it's a great way to consolidate your notes if you are looking for that we also have our lectures happening this week so with the lectures we've got our revision lectures like the one happening today and also head start lectures and head start lectures are for next year's class um, well the current year 11 is going into year 12 um, and it's and it kind of you know covers the sort of the first uh, like the content for term one so if you kind of want to brush up on that feel free to attend those lectures as well um, so we also have our lectures our discussion forums online it's an amazing community of like-minded students we have our newsletters our ADA calculator later um, and also lots of articles that range from you know study tips and strategies to like um, you know uni tips and just like sort of general student stuff that I'm sure a lot of you will find really helpful that I personally found really helpful because I love the website love using these resources so definitely check them out on our website so let's get started today's content so firstly before we do that I'll introduce myself so my name is Aditi I graduated in 2021 as a Ducks uh, with an ADA of 95 so the subjects that um, I teach include English extension advanced PDH PE and biology um, and so I'm currently at the University of Sydney studying a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Advanced Studies in Medical Science as a Delgill Scholar so I'm majoring in medical science and political economy now if you have any questions about uni about um, any coursework or anything please feel free to ask those as well I'll try my best to help uh, yeah to help you out I mean I'm still trying to figure it I'm still trying to figure out all of that stuff myself but um, yeah if you have any questions I can always try my best to help with that um, but yeah and I love in general reading good show sunny days and currently it is shaping to be a very sunny and a very hot day for me um it is like shining but it's amazing I'm loving the summers or oh, the beginning of the spring it's I uh, yeah so you know it's been really exciting so let's get started we have lots to get through today and I know you guys will probably be really um excited in a way I guess maybe not quite the best word, maybe not jittery or nervous. I'm probably a bit nervous with the HSE exams coming up. But look, my aim today is to essentially revise the main components of the HSE biology syllabus, right? To get you um, ready and confident for sort of the main, um, yeah, like across the main talking points of the syllabus. Um, now, please make sure that you check anything that does not make sense ask me i am here for questions i can definitely answer your bio questions if not you know <laughs> any uni technicality questions definitely answer your bio questions i've been doing this for a while i'm studying biology at um university now so i think i'll be i'll be okay with that um and i'll be answering your questions live so this is obviously recording and i'll be live answering your questions and that reminds me that you'll be able to firstly view this recording afterwards as well so come back to the page and view this recording afterwards you will also be able to um access the slides that I'm going through like just underneath your screen uh, or well, underneath my sort of screen where, where this video is playing just underneath probably on your left hand side corner you should see um, the slides a button so I click and download the slides and what else um, 
I'm just remembering not forgetting anything. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and I'll be, like I said, I'll be live to answer any questions. So please don't be, um, yeah, please don't be shy. Please don't hesitate to ask any questions. No questions, a silly question. Even if you feel like, you know, you should know the answer to this, but you're not too sure, ask. Always ask. Um, finally, remember that, you know, you're going to smash this out. You have to give yourself a bit more credit. You guys have gone through an amazing year. Um, well, what I hope has been an amazing year. Um, and, you know, biology is definitely a very uh, content-heavy subject. So if you have stuck with it until the end, cheers to you. And we're gonna we're gonna go through this together. So hopefully today you'll walk away feeling um, a bit more confident and a bit more ready. And I'm sure you guys are obviously you know looking forward to maybe not forward to the exams, but certainly the period after that, the summer, the schoolies period after that. So I'm excited for that for you guys because I think it'd be really fun and the weather shaping up to be amazing. So. Yeah, let's get started, shall we? Um, so the HSC syllabus. Now, hopefully we are all very familiar with this. If you've forgotten something, that is okay. It happens. Uh, but, but, but now is a good time to like really solidify this and glue it in your minds. Um, so we've got module, C, uh, module 5, which is heredity. And it's, in module 5, we're focusing on reproduction across like... Um, across different types of organisms and we're focusing on um also the different types of reproduction different um and like we want to know examples for it um i just might just grab a tissue sorry all right let's see if i can find a tissue now after i open a new box excuse me sorry i'm just recovering from a flu from the viral so yeah please excuse me um all right so where was that okay so back back to module five so module five heredity we are looking we are looking firstly at reproduction we're looking and the key question is how does reproduction ensure the continuation of a species right so you have to look at different types of reproduction you have to look at different uh, different types of fertilizations um and we want to know example across examples across different organisms as well cell replication is now looking at those molecular processes of mitosis and meiosis and how is our DNA being ready? Uh, you know, it's being scared, yeah, it's being ready, um, being made ready at rather before we can go ahead and have DNA um, and protein synthesis. So remember, replication happens before that. And then we look at genetic variation. And finally, we finish off by looking at inheritance patterns in a population. Module six is um, obviously the smallest one out of the four. <laughs> And it's also the one that has a lot of similarities, I would say, across, um, like, it has a lot of overlap between the other three modules. So mutations, um, we start off by looking at the different types of mutations and their causes, and their effects as well, and that links really closely back to module 5. <coughs> <coughs> then we look at biotech. Now, biotechnology also kind of links back to module six uh no module seven and eight a lot because we look at technologies um and how they can be used to treat different uh disorders and then we also look at genetic technologies so that's module six um and like i said there's a lot of overlap between the other sort of modules with that one now what you'll find is that you get a lot of inter intermodule you get a lot of like um yeah you get a lot of inter intermodule questions as well especially the higher mark questions in biology they do tend to ask you to apply your knowledge across like two different modules um, and those questions are very popular for those higher marks because it you know it sort of tests your knowledge if you can synth apply the content that you've learned from these two different topics and synthesize it and bring it together 
module seven is infectious diseases uh, and within that we're looking at what are the causes of infectious diseases we're looking at responses to pathogens then we look at immunity so we get like a very surface level dive into immunity which is always very exciting um if you know if you're into sort of the and uh, not not quite the anatomy but definitely like the physiology and the, sort of the anatomy side of things um and also we look at the uh, we look at prevention treatment and control of infectious diseases and that one has definitely been uh, more relevant in contemporary times because of the fact that you know we have gone through a pandemic just before um just a couple of well, it's funny now because because we're still kind of it's still there but it's not kind of there um but you know we've gone through a pandemic so we know uh, a, like a lot of it is pretty intuitive when it comes to like you know treatment and control and like prevention which like mainly focuses on like um hygiene and quarantine and so on and we and like i said we're all pretty familiar with that finally module eight is non-infectious diseases so this is where we now look at um, home we start off by looking at homeostasis which is a very interesting topic and that's basically your body's machinery of um yeah your your body's sort of internal machinery and its purpose to sort of maintain a, a stable internal environment despite the changing external conditions um we also look at the causes and effects of non-infectious diseases we look at epidemiology um and then we look at prevention and finally technologies and disorders and then in technologies and disorders again you get a bit of a taste of again like a very surface level taste of um anatomy and physiology in the sense that you know we sort of see the structure of your so the three that you have to do according to the syllabus are your ears eyes and kidneys so it's like you, know, you get to sort of see what is how does e actually work how is it structured and then what is the function of it so it's quite interesting um all of that so yeah that's you know the module sorry that's the whole biology syllabus um but there is like i said lots of intricacies within each module so let's attack that um <coughs> so let's have a look we're going to look at the key concepts today of reproduction we're going to look at dna replication we'll look at protein synthesis and then we'll look at in inheritance which is um Punnett squares and pedigrees so we won't quite be covering meiosis and mitosis today <laughs> So, so yeah, we won't cover that um, and we won't cover uh, DNA sequencing and profiling. So you can obviously access, uh, yeah, like you can obviously access past lectures as well where we've gone through this in a lot of detail. Um, we also have, uh, there's also lots of good online videos. Like for example, with mitosis and meiosis, um, you'll find lots of really nice animations on YouTube if you really want to sort of, if, if it's, if if you're finding it a bit hard to understand what's happening just because you know you're reading over the steps but it still doesn't quite make sense um i would 100 percent recommend watching a youtube video on it um and one that i really like is like the the channel that really worked for me that i really liked for all of these bio concepts was um the amoeba sisters they're really good um and like and yeah and the um uh, the animations are really nice and so it makes a lot of sense because you know it's like yeah it's very visual um yeah alternatively crash course is also a great website to use they can sometimes go in a bit of detail but you know it's it's still really nice in terms of the explanation so definitely check those out but let's get started with reproduction so give me one sec Okay, so <coughs> we've got um, essentially pregnancy hormones. We're going to look at that part of the um, dot point because it's generally the one that's not overlooked, but I think it's one that people tend to forget the most. Um, so there are the so we've sort of categorized the um, main hormones that are involved in um, birth into four categories the first one are the uh, are the bleeders these rule the menstrual cycle so you've got aphasis, oh, 
FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, which is the luteinizing hormone. So they regulate the menstrual cycle. Um, and then we've got the controller, which releases the hormones. And so we've got HCG, which is the human chronic um, gonadotrophin. And that is, you can also remember it as a hormone control guy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's a controller. So that so the human chronic gonadotrophin releases um, these hormones, and then once the mother is um, once the eggs have been fertilized, this is where we've got the growers. Now they stimulate growth in the mother and the baby, and that's estrogen and progesterone. Um, and finally, when it's time for labor, you've got the pushes. So you've got oxytocin, you've got relaxin, and you've got progesterone. Um, so these are all really important and you want to know them. These are just basic summaries for you guys to remember what the sort of the links are between each. But I would recommend to go ahead and jot down actual notes of, for example, what is estrogen doing when it is um, stimulating that growth in the mother and the baby? What is HSC doing? What is oxytocin and relaxin doing, right? So I would definitely recommend to go ahead and jot down more detailed notes. Um, just a couple of points, but I just want you to remember also the categories here so that you can actually remember them. Um, so let's move on now to DNA replication. DNA replication um, is obviously it's a long process in the sense that there's a lot going on. So we need to remember some of the really key important um, terminologies and you know enzymes and stuff that are involved. So <coughs> we start off, the first process is initiation. So in initiation, the DNA is unzipped by helicase, by the enzyme helicase. So that's where, um, so that's helicase right there. Oh, I'm going to get my little pointer pen thingy out. There we go. Alrighty, so that's helicase there. So helicase comes ahead, oops, and um, unzips the DNA. And then what happens is we've, the second process is elongation. So it moves forward, which means that as it's unzipping the DNA, we've got DNA polymerase, which is going to bind at primer sites. So this is DNA polymerase. It's going to bind at primer sites. Now, primers are, uh, are our RNA primers that are going to come and show the polymerase where to bind. So that's what they are. So they are RNA primers. Um, <clears throat> it is, you know, DNA. Oh, God. Why is this not letting me make, like, right? Don't have the best hand handwriting with the cursor with the cursor, but let's try. Um, here we go. So, even though this is DNA replication, what is happening is the primer that is coming here and showing DNA polymerase where to go is an RNA primer. So, RNA. All right. So RNA primer. Cool. So <coughs> what happens is once it has, once it binds, it then starts to read the strand, read the strand and attach the free floating um, nucleotides. Now, the thing, the really important thing here is that we need to remember that um, DNA replication is happening in the five prime to three prime direction right so it's happening from five prime to three prime so what so one strand is fine because it's going forward this way but one strand is um coming backwards it's coming backwards so dna pol uh, pol uh, polymerase moves along the old strand in three to five direction and creates a new strand in the five to three prime direction so as you can see here it is coming, I'm just trying to, where is it? Let me just rub this bit out for a second, sorry. So I can, okay, here we go. And let's go this way. Okay. <coughs> so what happens is the five prime to three prime direction is fine. Cause it's, you know, that's the way the DNA polymerase goes. But when it's coming back in the three, 
uh, in, from the three prime to the five prime direction, what happens is is that it is going to be putting on the nucleotides backwards. And because of the fact that it's putting it on backwards, we get something called Okazaki fragments. And that's just that you've got these groups of basically um, these groups of nucleotides. So there's like gaps in between. And so after the process is finished, um, we have uh, we we see after like polymerase finishes the pro, um, finishes the whole process, it reaches the end of the molecule and it falls off. And then what happens is the the Okazaki fragments they are filled, and so it's like proper strand of DNA with like no gaps in between. But because initially the DNA strand is going backwards when the nucleotides are being added, there are gaps in between which are then filled by the enzymes. So that's elongation and then termination is when polymerase reaches the end of the molecule, um, it falls off and that's it. And so then um, the strand <laughs> And then the strand essentially will recoil into a double helix. So remember, <clears throat> it's organized into a double helix because of the fact that there's so much information that we have to preserve. Um, and so as a result of that, once it's all over, it's going to twist back into the double, uh, the, into the double DNA helix. Um, and proofreading also will occur by nuclease enzymes. Um, proofreading is really important because of the fact that... Um, <clears throat> there can be obviously mistakes and that's where proofreading comes in uh this process is something that we need to know really well because we'll come back to this when we look at mutations and how mutations can affect the dna and the genome so that's dna replication if you have any questions please ask there are no silly questions please ask all right so okay Alrighty, so let's have a look now at polypeptide synthesis. So, polypeptide synthesis is basically, think of it as a recipe to create proteins. And a kitchen is going to be the ribosomes, right? So, in the cell, it's going to be the ribosomes. That's where we go to create our proteins. Um, you know, we prep our stuff. Let's say you prep your stuff in the living room because you're sitting and, you know, you're just like chopping up the veggies while you're sitting down. But then when you actually have to cook, you get up and you go to the ribosomes. You go to the kitchen to cook. Okay, think of it that way. So that's what happens. The first process to uh, transcription happens in the nucleus. Second process, translation happens in the ribosome. So what is actually happening? So what happens is that essentially step one of transcription is that we start off with our double uh, with our DNA strand right with a double DNA strand so RNA polymerase now because it's because now we want to what we're doing now is we are going from DNA we're going from D oh this is not letting me <sighs> looks like my computer's had enough of my handwriting because I've been doing it for my other lectures as well and it's not the best. Um, but let's try this. Okay, we're, go we're going from DNA to RNA. So now we've got RNA polymerase coming along. And what RNA polymerase is going to do is it's going to come along and we're going to open up the DNA double strand. Now, once we open it up, we have messenger RNA come through. Now, the main difference between RNA and DNA is that firstly, RNA is just made of ribose sugar. DNA is dioxyribose. That's the big difference between the two. So the sugar in the, um, in the backbone is different for RNA and DNA. And then on top of that, in RNA, you've got uracil instead of thymine. Um, and the reason that happens is because of, um, and, and you don't need to know this, but the 
if you are interested to know why it changes from thiamine to uracil in RNA is because of like mutations happening to thiamine and as a result it becomes uracil. No, mutations happening to cyt well it affects cytosine and thiamine and then as a result it becomes uracil. So you don't have to know it in a lot, lot of detail. Um, it's part of something what I'll you know it's my learning from uni this year second year so you definitely don't have to know it but it's just there in case you want to know it. It's because of mutations essentially that we see uh, we see that distinction between the two. So, but yeah, but you need to remember that it's actually uracil in RNA. So it's going to be uracil paired against um, adenine and not thymine. So let's have a look now. Essentially, here we are. So mRNA comes in and what mRNA is, go mRNA is going to do is again, go from five prime to three prime direction and it's going to start making a template strand. But now every time instead of a t there's going to be a u alrighty so it's of a t there's a u so we have that replacement here um one is the and dna and sorry rna polymerase <coughs> and it's rna polymerase that is essentially uh taking the whole process through that's really important rna polymerase is RNA polymerase is taking the whole process through um, and so we've got a coding strand, a template strand and then the RNA there. So <coughs> let's have a look. Um, Alrighty now wood transcription so once we've got the once the mRNA is gone and we've got that mRNA strand with uracil on it <coughs> so sorry what happens next is that a process called splicing occurs. So splicing is. <coughs> oh goodness. Um, give me one sec. Okay. No more sneezes. So splicing is basically when. So when we get that mRNA strand. It's got everything in it. So what we need to remember is that a whole of a like a whole DNA is not coding for protein. So, um, <coughs> or not. Um, that's why I was fine yesterday. I don't know what happened, but anyways, let's focus. So the thing here is that a whole um. Uh, DNA does not code for protein. There is junk DNA, there is regulatory DNA, and then there's coding DNA as well. But coding DNA um, is actually not a lot, so it's quite interesting. So what's, what happens is that when we get that mRNA, when we get that mRNA template, right, it's got everything in it, but we don't want that because we need to actually, we need the code to then make the protein, right? Because um, so, you know, let's say I've got, I've chopped up everything, I've chopped up all the vegetables, but I only want to make, uh, but I want to make pasta, so I'm not going to put potatoes in pasta, and I'm not going to put, I don't know, beans in my pasta, so I'm going to leave the beans and the potatoes out, I'm only going to take the capsicum and the onions with me into the kitchen, so that's kind of what's happening here. So, what happens is, we take out... So we've got the exons and then we've got the introns. Alrighty. So it's the exons that we want. So we take the exons, as you can see here, and we leave the introns out of it. Alrighty. So we leave the introns out, we cut the introns out, and we take the exons. We take our coding DNA. And once we do that, we end up with mature mRNA. And we're going to use that mature mRNA to make our proteins. But we've still got one more step to go before we can do that. So, now, that's transcription. Transcription is going from DNA to mRNA. Translation is now when we go from mRNA to the proteins, but we use, but this is where tRNA comes in because it's translation. So, Let's look at this image right here. So we've got a T, so it's our tRNA, and it's got three anticodons. 
and each anti and, and and the anticodon sorry so it's got anticodon which is made up of three rna molecules or, or three rna nucleotides basically and it codes for an amino acid now hopefully you would have all seen that table that sort of shows the different combinations of the amino of the um amino acids right like what codons make what amino acids so that so what happens now is that within the ribosome we've got all of these all of our different um amino acids floating around let's just say right right here we've got them here and they're coded for goodness why is it doing that today um, and they're coded for by different, um, by a group of, or, or by like a specific anticodon. Let's say that it's coded by a specific anticodon. So what happens is now I've come to the ribosomes, I've come to the kitchen with my capsicums and onions, right? I didn't, so that's all I need to make my pasta. <laughs> so I've come in and now what we're going to see is that the um as the mrna comes into the ribosomes the complementary anticodons attach to the codons so the ones on the mrna are our codons and then we see anticodons attached to it so if we've got acg attaching here that means this one is going to be what's this one going to be if you said uracil, you're correct. If you said thiamine, you're kind of correct. But remember, it's RNA, so it's going to be uracil. Uh, so it's going to be uracil. C is going to be C is going to bond to uh, G, guanine, and then G is going to bond, bond, uh, bond to C. So as a result, this thing here. So we've got our codons. They're going to. They are basically going to bind to their specific anticodons. It's the same. Um, you know, it's the same sort of nucleotide bonding here. So, this is what's happening. As a strand is going along, the right anticodons are come out, are going to come and bind. And now when they, and this is what's happening when they come and bind. So remember, we've got amino acid here, and now tRNA is bringing those codons, those anticodons to the uh, mRNA. So remember, this is m. Is seriously why is it doing that um here we go i'm gonna try and write so this is m rna and this is trna Alrighty. remember these are codons it's annoying me now why is it making those straight lines? And this is anticodons. Is it gonna make it this time? Let's see. Oh god. Made it twice this time. Wow. <laughs> okay. These are anticodons. Alrighty. So that's that. Alrighty. So we've got our tRNA. We've got our anticodons. And then we've got mRNA and we've got our codons. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, finally, what happens is once they match up and once the codons and the anticodons match, we get our amino acids. And these are going to be our amino acids. And then our amino acids are going to form polypeptide chains and we're going to form proteins. And remember, there are different structures of proteins. There's primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, and quaternary structures um, and proteins are obviously really important because they have a huge role to play in structure and in function and in function within our body um our enzymes are proteins you know uh, your hair your nails everything needs protein um you need protein obviously as a diet thing as well so it's, it's part of that as well so it's really important that you understand the whole process this was obviously like a little crash course with um to sort of explain the basics of the process in case you may have forgotten or just to rejog your memory but remember that is you know the key there but i would obviously recommend to go back and look at your notes um and if you don't have them you know add to them and make sure that you understand the process and i would also recommend watching some youtube clips because they are really good in terms of their animations 
um and the animations are really really helpful in having like a really good visual picture of what is happening um as you could see i mean i could try to animate but you saw how my handwriting turned out so <laughs> i'm not sure so i'm not sure how much hope we have for animating guys but um i hope the explanation helped all right and check out those videos to to get a better understanding of how it all looks when it's happening alrighty um yeah so remember would you know you've got like it's not a process that's happening all in the same place it's a very dynamic process it's a very dynamic process remember we start off in the living room when, when with our DNA we're making an mRNA copy I'm chopping down all the vegetables that I've got but then I realize that hey I'm only I'm eating pasta so I only want to put capsicums and onions in my pasta so I'm only gonna take that with me which is my mature DNA uh, which is my mature RNA only the bit that's actually going to code for the proteins that I want and so I take that into the kitchen with me and use that to cook and that's what's happening there so let us move on then um okay and so yep that results in our protein um and we've kind of already spoken about the you know the sort of the key processes now remember after translation we do have post translational um sort of checks and edits that are happening so that we can get the mature protein ready so let's have a look um at so this is basically a little um summary for you of all the processes so what's happening in terms of where we sort of start off what we end up with and then how we begin again with translation so just quickly go through it again in transcription remember we're in the nucleus rna polymerase binds to the promoter sequence and then from there it's moving along the dna strand now it's only going to unbind a small region of the dna so the reason for that is that we are not you know remember the whole dna is not coding for proteins and then on top of that specific regions code for specific things and we only ever need to code for specific parts or, or you know specific proteins you don't use the whole thing so it only, it's going to unbind a small region that we need the rna polymerase will read this strand and it will make the complementary um free floating nucleotides to create an mrna chain it's mrna it's mRNA because remember RNA we're using uracil and then once it's done there's a terminator sequence that ends the, uh, the that ends the transcription of the DNA and it releases the mRNA molecule um, and then remember we have a splicing and post um, transcriptional that should say transcriptional not translational um, modifications are made to that mRNA because we don't want the whole thing we just want the bit that's coding for the DNA <laughs> And so we only take that with us to the kitchen, which is our ribosome. So that's where translation happens. So translation, <coughs> think of transcription as like copying the recipe and then translation actually translating the recipe into the food. So translation, mRNA docks to a ribosome. The ribosome matches that complementary tRNA molecule to the mRNA. So it matches the codon to the anticodon. Alrighty, and so after that, the when the molecules dock, right, when the RNA molecules dock, a polypeptide is formed. So those amino acids, they form to, they start to form these polypeptide bonds. Um, and that's, you know, like actual chemical bonds so that they stick together. And once they have done that, there's a polypeptide chain of amino acids. And when a stop sequence is reached, that's when the ribosomes release the mRNA, so they let that go, and they also let go of the polypeptide molecule. And then the polypeptide folds, right, uh, and then it undergoes post-translational modifications and result in a mature protein, which can then be used in the cells for a lot, for, you know, a diverse range of reasons. Okay, let us move on then. <laughs> Okay, so this last bit of module five, inheritance. Uh, this bit, I would say the 
best way to understand this bit and the best way to actually answer these questions is to just draw di like diagrams that's it draw diagrams that are going to be really 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 helpful um yeah and just do practice questions because i mean there are definitely with this and we'll go through there are definitely um like tips for it and you can see like different patterns and sort of generic tips but the best way to feel confident in these is to actually um do lots of questions and draw them out whenever you get a question draw these things out don't ever try to like do it in your head always draw it out so remember there are two things that uh we do here the first is we draw pedigrees and um the function of a pedigree is to actually trace back different characteristics and traits within generations um and it allows us to see like the overall pattern of you know how is the disease sort of um or how is the trait rather being passed on um who's getting it how you know is it like like how often is it showing within the lineage um and then punnett squares on the other hand on the other hand are actually to rather see how genes can pass um from parent to offspring so pedigrees are helping us trace phenotypes things that we can actually see or conditions that can be um seen uh, or seen and like you know diagnosed and stuff so those actual like the phenotypes um pe uh, punnett squares are genotypes you know we are sort of looking at potential uh combinations of what is what alleles can you know an individual get from like the different combinations of their parents so this is giving us information about potential genotypes and phenotypes so whenever you get a question like this the checklist is you want to have a key you want to have parental phenotypes and genotypes um and then you want to fill in the punnett square and then you want to comment on the um offspring's genotype and their phenotype and you want to do that both and you and, and i mean <coughs> questions can like suggest that if they want you to do it as a percentage or as a ratio um if they don't suggest it just do it as both because yeah that's not hard to like just convert between the two so just do it as both to be on the safer side so let's have a look um at pedigree checklist how do we actually determine if a disease is autosomal dominant recessive x-linked um dominant recessive or y-linked or mitochondrial this is a really interesting one and best way to sort of get better at this is to actually go ahead and do these questions you'll find lots of them um, and you'll find actually questions not only in the multiple choice but also like um short answer questions in the past hses where they've actually asked you to draw these out and to be able to comment on you know why would a certain condition be x linked versus autosomal so let's have a look at what the traits are of each uh <coughs> so if now remember autosomal means that it is not on the sex chromosome x linked is that it is on the um sorry so autosomal means that it's yeah it's not on the sex chromosomes it's on the other 22 x linked is that it's on the x chromosome specifically and then y linked is that it is of the y chromosome um so autosomal recessive so if a uh, condition is autosomal recessive it will appear in both sexes with equal frequency and it will affect and affected offsprings are sometimes born to unaffected parents because it is uh, recessive that's why we can see that unaffected uh, individuals can have affected offsprings it's because it's recessive so it can like skip a generation um autosomal dominant again because it's autosomal it's gonna appear with equal frequency in both sexes however um affected offspring will have at least one affected parent because it's dominant because it's on the because it's dominant so it's like for example it's uh you know, like homozygous so it's going to be it's going to be there it, at least one parent will be affected so if something's dominant let's say the parent is heterozygous they're still going and if and it's a dominant condition they're still going to be affected because it's on that dominant chromosome if that makes sense um because it's hard to explain that without like diagrams and actually like drawing it out but again um 
not quite think I'm not quite going to draw it, but you know what I mean. You know, for example, if we go H, H, right, if it's dominant, that's heterozygous, but if it's a dominant condition, this person with this genotype is still going to be affected. Um, then X-linked dominant. Now, X-linked dominant means that it's on the X chromosome. And now because it's on the X chromosome, <coughs> we can generally see that females will be more often affected. Um, and because it is dominant, it's not going to skip a generation. You're going to see it in every generation. And then affected sons will, must have an affected mother. So if it's X-linked dominant, one of the, like, uh, the... <coughs> one of the main ways to tell if it is X-linked dominant um, is if it is going from an affected mother to an affected son. Um, <coughs> and if it is um, an unaffected father, for example, if a father is affected, he will pass it on, the trait onto all their daughters. So, so the way this works basically, <laughs> Is that remember because it's X-linked dominant first. See dominant when it's dominant, you know that it's not going to skip a generation. Recessive, it's going to skip a generation. However, in terms of X-linked, good way uh, a, a good way to tell it is that firstly females are more affected. Secondly, affected sons must have an affected mother, and the reason for that is because sons get their X chromosome from their mothers because they only get so they only have one X chromosome. <laughs> Whereas, um, so then we get one X chromosome, whereas daughters will get, like, they'll have, two, so women have two X chromosomes. So what that means is that um, an affected father, because the father will only have one X chromosome, so he's only going to pass on the one X chromosome, so father will pass the trait onto all of their daughters. That's the, the logic behind it. Then X-linked recessive. Now, with X-linked recessive, more males are uh, more males than females are affected. That's another key um, key way to tell. And with X-linked recessive, approximately half of the carrier mother's sons are affected. That's another like really obvious way to tell if it's X-linked recessive. So I would definitely like to jot these down because it's like these patterns are the best way to tell. Otherwise, there are so many possibilities and, you know, and it's hard to sort of figure everything out within the limited minutes you have to attempt the question and the limited information you're given. So I would use these little prompts as a way in patterns to, to seek out and to eliminate other um, options. So, and remember, X-linked recessive, it can skip a generation. While linked dominant, we don't actually see a lot of questions about that, but you can obviously see them, and that's why linked. Remember, only males have a Y chromosome, so only males males will be affected. It will be passed from father to all sons because they get, you know, um, like all what do you call it? They get the Y chromosome from the father, and it does not skip a generation because it's dominant. Mitochondrial is treat is a, is a trait which is inherited from the mother only and all children of a mother are at risk to be affected or to be carriers if it's mitochondrial again you don't see it as often um these are sort of the main ones these four uh, but it's good to know these two down the bottom let's move on then to module six look at us go okay Module 6, we're going to go quickly through everything. So let's have a look. Mutations. There are essentially two types. Firstly, there are structural chromosome mutations. These are mutations to the chromosomes themselves that have happened during, um, for example, during myosis, right? So these are actual, uh, these are actual chromosomal mutations. So there are four types. There is deletion, there is inversion, there is translocation, duplication. And as the name suggests, in deletion, a chunk of the chromosomes um, cut down on. Inversion, it's been inverted. Translocation, like it's been switched. And then duplication is that, you know, it's been added on again at the top. So when there is a mutation in the chromosome numbers, where's my thingy? here we go when there is um 
when there is a mutation in chromosome numbers, essentially we classify that as either aniplety or polyplety. So aniplety is when there when the overall number of the chromosome um, chromosomes is different between the parent and the offspring. So the offspring has one extra or you know one less uh, chromosome. And Down syndrome, for example, is an example of when um, the offspring has 47 chromosomes instead of 46 chromosomes. Polypolity is when an organism contains more than two sets of homologous chromosomes. It's not the overall number. I mean, obviously it will affect the overall number, but it's actually like this, for example, three sets of chromosomes. So tripolity is a condition in which fetus has um, three copies of every homologous chromosome instead of only two copies. So that's chromosomal mutations. Now, point mutations. Point mutations, essentially, um, these are the ones that are happening within the sequences of the codons. So let's say we start off with a normal um, codon sequence of A, G, C, double A, G, double G, C. So that gives us these three uh, amino acids, all right? Now, if there is substitution, let's say, during the and now remember mutations can be chemical they can be um <coughs> electromagnetic right so what happens is with mutations um let and mutations can cause the like nucleotide sequences to shift within your dna to change and so let's say that a mutation has happened and they and you know it's happened and it's not been detected by like the error system that actually checks everything and makes sure everything is right so it's not been detected so there's a substitution that has occurred and instead of the a g c the g has been replaced with a u and that substitution has actually caused for the amino acid here to change that substitution mutations Frame shift mutations are when the there's been a shift of the actual strand, which has caused like a downstream effect. So there can be insertion where another nucleotide has been inserted within, um, and that can again lead to actually, and you can see here that can actually lead to the whole sequence the whole three amino acids changing and in deletion one of the parts has been deleted and that causes also um obviously one amino acid to be removed and the other two to be changed completely so then how do we actually classify these mutations so we've got two types of mutations um two types of point mutations we've got substitution and frame shift frame shift can include insertion and deletion now the effects the way we classify them are either missense nonsense or silent now if a mutation is missense that means that we mutations which edit the codon sequences so there has been a change in the amino in this uh, in the amino acid that has been sort of you know that's been a result of the whole process so there's been a change in that amino acid so now instead of getting um ser we got ile right so that's that nonsense is when we introduce a premature stop codon um, and that is seen here with the UAG. That is a stop codon, um, and so we've it, like we've prematurely stopped the process. Finally, a silent mutation is when there has been a mutation, but it's actually not affected the amino acid. Because remember, there there can be more than now. Think back to the table uh, that you would have looked at. You know when you're looking at like uh, converting. The, between the anticodons and the amino acids so think of the fact that um there are more than like one anti like there's yeah more than one anticodon for some of the amino acids so here we have um agu will also result in so whereas agc will also result in the same amino acid so that's what we have you know that is what has happened but luckily there has been no effect on the amino acid so you want to know the two types of mutations, structural versus point mutations, and then within each you want to know the categories as well and the effects. Okay, um, so that's biotech. Uh, let's have a look now at 
recombinant DNA technologies. So, sorry, did I say that, that was biotech? No, that's mutations. Whoops. Um, so, we'll go straight to genetic technologies and we'll quickly talk about some of the key, um, key, key technologies here. So, we've got recombinant DNA technology. And recombinant DNA technology is when we are joining DNA from two different species in order to produce a new genetic combination. So it's basically, um, so basically a simple version of this is, for example, we take a recombinant plasmid. So a plasmid that contains the genetic information of two or more organisms, right? So we've got the first plasmid and what we do is we open up the plasmid, we open it up and we digest it with restriction enzymes. So what restriction enzymes do is our restriction enzymes will open up the plasmids at like a specific point that we want them to open up on. And so it will open it up and we'll insert a target gene there. So once we insert it there, we then join it up with DNA ligase, which is kind of like a glue, basically. Um, you know, it's, ob it's obviously an enzyme, but it works like a glue to stick it all together. And then we get recombinant plasmids. So a recombinant plasmid will have the DNA will will have the sort of obviously the genetic um, qualities of the recon of the plasmid itself and then also we have the target gene which is um, inserted in it so yeah um, so they're like for example with restriction enzymes a quick note on that there are different types of restriction enzymes for different types of plasmids and um, generally for different types of plasmids and they cut the plasmids at different points um, at different base pairs so it's wherever we want to insert our target gene we use a specific restriction enzyme to cut open the plasmid at that specific place so that we can get a recombinant plasmid so that that actually you know works and sticks together Alrighty, looking at the production of transgenic organisms. So transgenic organisms, essentially, so we start off with an individual. We are going to isolate DNA from that organism. We are then going to sequence that DNA to sort of see, you know, to get the whole genome. <coughs> and then we're going to identify that gene sequence. We will then create lots of copies of that gene sequence using polymerase chain reaction. So it's going to create lots and lots of copies, depending on how many, generally it's like you run 30 rounds of it, so it creates lots and lots of copies. And once it does that, we then verify the gene. So we make sure that we've got the right gene. So we use gel electrophoresis. Um, basically, what happens is we put in these are the bands the base pairs that we put in as like a benchmark and then we test against that one two three four right so we test which one matches up the most with this so which one matches up the most with the benchmark here so that's that gel electrophoresis and then we put the gene into an organism um, and we can do that by doing the whole um, restriction ends up coding so by making a recombinant DNA and then through that we then transform the organism so we can also put the gene into um so we could do it using trans uh, trans, uh sorry restriction enzyme cloning we can also do transfection so we can di directly um insert it into the nucleus or we can use a micro injection as well to insert it in so there are three ways in which it can be done so if you have any questions please ask uh, but I'm hoping this process made sense. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, anything I can help out with, please ask. Okay, so um, a huge part of this syllabus is now to also look at the um, ethics of biotechnology. So yeah, we focus on the <coughs> social and economical implication of these processes. So, the ethical positives of biotechnology are that firstly, that um, they meet the growing needs of society, right? So, they improve um, quality of life. For example, it meets the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and it can help in ending poverty and hunger. So, now that we're referring here to the positives of 
genetically modified crops and genetically modified organisms like bananas and um, corn and BT cotton so all of them um, really important and um, genetically modified and so that can help us with ending poverty and hunger it can improve health and well-being so you know now instead of for example with BT cotton instead of spraying um, harmful insecticides to get rid of the pathogen we have just genetically engineered it so that we don't have to do that anymore um, yeah, so improving health and well-being, access to clean water and sanitation, clean energy, sustainable cities, harnesses biological tools to invent new creative solution. Genetic diversity um, is an interesting one because by creating these new products, you are creating genetic diversity. But we'll talk about the um, sort of the reverse of that very soon um creating new uh, creating new arrangements of genes new allele combinations allows for organisms to adapt to their environment ultimately accelerates the process of evolution open source information and it leads to the creation of public databases to allow for to allow for biological knowledge to be shared However, there are concerns, concerns regarding ownership, who actually owns these technologies, um, should we actually allow people or corporations to, all, to own the biological information, economic benefits versus innovation, there are lots of economic benefits, um, so lots of economic benefits, especially with monocultures, so the Cavendish banana, for example, is an example of a monoculture. So there's just that one species of bananas around the world. Um, and that was because it was genetically engineered because um, the banana species before that, it... <coughs> Sorry. So the, gen uh, the banana species before that, it fell... Um, victim to the uh, Panama disease um, which is like a rust fungal disease um, and affected banana populations and that's why there was like I can't remember I think it was around 2000 and, uh, 2009 10 8 <laughs> like around that category where you would have seen banana prices like rocket um, because of that so after that they created Cavendish bananas which you know sort of sh which was to sort of obviously um, I think it took out the gene or it sort of made it um, immune to that specific disease but now there has been lots of um, lots of concerns with that because of the fact now because it's now fallen victim to a new type of pathogen because and now because there's a monoculture of bananas there's no actual diversity in the species of bananas to fight that specific disease off um, so yeah, so you know, there's lots of economic benefits, but what is the uh, price of innovation here? Uh, intellectual property constraints can be prohi prohi uh, prohibitive to process. And there is a case study on zinc finger technologies that you can read. Uh, there is also commercial implementation. Biotech monopolies is a big one. Um, companies with vast resources dominate the market and they definitely drive up uh, and they definitely uh, drive on the processes of the products um, program dependency consumer writer choices like does everyone want to like does everyone want to eat genetically modified crops what if they want organic crops um, regulation governments is there a balance between safety and innovation that they can uh, you know strive towards biohack uh, biohacking and eugenics so eugenics um, is an interesting new word that you'll learn today and uh, this is how that uh, and this is the idea that genetic technologies may be used to purposefully improve the genetic character of a population and that is um, ver a very controversial practice um past examples include world war Two. so world war Two um is an example of that during the world war Two, when there was the um yeah focus on like improving the genetic character of the population by like only um by recruiting people and testing on people who looked a certain way um yeah so 
now at this table here is a really good source for that i recommend you guys have a look at uh it's basically looking at the fancy philosophy terms that you can use in your responses and it shows the marker that you sort of um especially with like these ethic questions it's really good to have that vocabulary um as well okay um so let's have a look now at what was seven I'll just grab a quick sip. Alright, looks like we're going well according to time. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so. Key concepts in Module 7. Causes. We won't quite look at causes today. We're going to focus on response, immunity, and prevention, treatment, and control. That's what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to talk about our, our first line of defense includes our skin, our chemical secretions, um, our skin, our chemical secretions, and also things like... Um, yeah, the toxins that we secrete, so the antimicrobials we secrete in our skin. So I would recommend revising on that, so remembering the five elements of the first line of defense. What we're going to focus on today is the second line of defense. Um, and we'll start with the second line of defense and then we'll move into adaptive immunity. So the first and second line of defense is part of the innate immunity. So this is the immunity that is always there. Um, it is not reactive. So, okay, so it's not specific, rather, that's the better word. It's not specific to the pathogen, it's always there, and it's going to react in the same way. So the second line of defense um, includes, firstly, the lymph system. So the lymph system produces um, white blood cells that are responsible for the immune system. And with the immune system, it's not like one system somewhere in the body can bluff you know kind of like your digestive system or your um all of your other systems your respiratory system right the immune system is a lot more mobile and so what we see is that it's um it's spread throughout the body and the lymph nodes play a huge role in that so we see that there's um a lymph node there's a network of tissues and organs um that helps to get rid of uh the toxins and waste within our body and that's the lymph nodes um so that's that that's the first part the second part is inflammation so inflammation is the dilation of blood vessels and the infiltration of inflammatory cells so what happens is um histamine so wet let's say you have hurt yourself um you <coughs> you've i don't know you've um I'm just trying to think of something. Okay, you were at the park and you stepped on something sharp and now you have gotten like a, a like a, a penetration and um, it's bleeding, right? So what would happen immediately is, is that once you've done that, the pathogens would go in because you're at the park. Something's entered the body, um, some splint or something, it's entered the body and um, then it's obviously got, you know, pathogens on it because it's out in the environment. So now immediately your body is going to react to that. Your blood vessels will dilate um, and your inflammatory cells, so these are called histamines, they are going to rush, uh, so the histamines are going to cause them to rush to the site of infection and then that's where your blood flow will be concentrated and that's where you see swelling and redness because all of these are coming to now deal with these harmful substances that have entered your body. So that's inflammation. Third step is phagocytosis. Now, phagocytosis is conducted by special white blood cells called macrophages and neutrophils. Um, so what they do is they change their shape to engulf pathogens. So they basically eat up a pathogen um, and then destroy them using um uh, using acids within their cells like right? using like lysosomes so these are lysosomes they're going to come and destroy the pathogen within the cell so that's phagocytosis now do not confuse phagocytosis with apoptosis so phagocytosis is when a macrophage or a neutrophil comes and it eats up the pathogen 
Apoptosis is cell death to seal off the pathogen. So cells like macrophages and lymphocytes, they completely surround the pathogen. And after they surround the pathogen, um, they die. And so what happens is once that happens, they form a cyst, which is then filled with pus and it blocks pathogen movement. It blocks, it blocks nutrient supply to that um to that pathogen so that it cannot grow so that it cannot spread um and it dies so that's apoptosis so this is a regular cell but then once we see um you know it's been um infected apoptosis is initiated cell death the cell is going to die so that it can take down the pathogen with it okay so let's now have a look at what is the difference between the two what is the difference between adaptive and innate immunity so innate immunity is always there it is um essentially your body always has these mechanisms in place as soon as something happens these are going to jump at the chance to go and protect your body always there Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, arises when a pathogen enters your body um, and when it's not been dealt with with the innate immunity, then the adaptive immunity sets in, but it takes time. The elements of the innate immunity include the first and second line of defense. The elements of the adaptive immunity include B cells and T cells, and we'll talk about that. So kind of like two families of cells that are going to be really, really important. Um, specificity so <coughs> um innate immunity is non-specific so it's going to react the same way to every single disease or to every single <coughs> pathogen that enters your body however adaptive immunity is going to react differently to the pathogen the, to every pathogen so it's going to act specifically so it's a very specific process <coughs> sorry about that Looks like my immunity's been doing stuff. Uh, give me one sec. Alrighty. So. Alrighty. Where are we? Um, so, specificity. Yep. So, innate immunity, non-specific. Adaptive immunity, very specific. Um, and so, the thing with adaptive immunity is your body already has these T cells that are going to, like, it already has all of these. Um, basically, and we'll talk about this concept in just one second, but I want you to remember these these antibodies to these specific pathogens in their place, in the body. We just have to find them and react to the pathogen. So, your, so your body is like really, really cool in the fact that it already has all these defense mechanisms for things that it can encounter in the environment. We just have to find them, um, and that's what takes time. So, that is why the response rate of the innate immune system, which sort of jumps into action straight away because it's doing the same thing every time it encounters something is that it's very rapid it's very fast but with adaptive immunity the response rate is very slow or, or not very slow but it's pretty slow because on the first exposure it is going to try and find um it's going to try and find the specific antibody for that pathogen so a pathogen has an antigen on it like a marker that tells the body that it's like non-self cell and so your body is going to um your body has antibodies that are going to react to that um, and we already have all the antibodies we just need to find it that's why it's a slow response but once we find it we have something called the memory cells that are going to remember exactly what that antibody was to what specific antigen and that will circulate in your body and so the next time that you see that specific pathogen your body is going to react really fast so that is why innate immunity does not have any immunological memory because it's reacting in the same way every time adaptive adaptive immunity indeed has immunological memory because it remembers now how it dealt with that pathogen the first time around and so the second time it happens the response rate is really fast it's really quick and the concentration of the antibodies reaches uh, a lot higher than the first time around as well okay that's the the key there uh the key distinctions between um innate and adaptive immunity let's move on then um so where are we okay now we're going to look at t and b cells so let's have a look uh probably let's start with t cells first 
Uh, B cells are responsible for antibody mediated immunity. So what happens is that B cells, there are two types of B cells. We've got, we've got, uh, where are we? The slides are working. All right, we've got two types of uh, B cells. We've got a plasma B cells and then we've got a memory B cells. Our plasma B cells, these are the ones that provide immediate protection. Alrighty, so they are the ones that provide immediate protection. They secrete lots of antibodies and they have the same specificity as the parent cell. So, so this is after differentiation. So the B cell, it differentiates. Um, so we've got the B cells and then we've got the memory B cells. The memory B cells are the ones that have immunological memory. These guys are the ones that are going to remember to actually... Um, remember what that antigen was so that the net and then they remain in circulation so the next time that they encounter that pathogen they can react immediately t cells are responsible for cell mediated immunity so there are four types of t cells so there are four types of t cells and i've just realized that uh we can't quite see the writing on there for some reason oh there you go you've got the plasma b cells and the memory B cells, okay, that's funny. Uh, give me one second, let me see if I can highlight it. Uh, I, did not, I don't know, for some reason the color looks different on my slides. So let me just fix that. Give me one sec. Uh, where are we? Highlighter, and let's get. So we've got the pla. Oh no, that's even worse. <laughs> Okay, so as I was saying, we've got the plasma B cells. These guys are the ones that are going to remember that, that are going to immediately um, go ahead and secrete lots of antibodies. And memory B cells are the ones that are going to remember the pathogen for next time around. Then we've got four types of, um, and then we've got four types of, there we go, that's better. Much, not much better, but it's, better you guys can see it now and then we've got four types of t-cells we've got cytotoxic killer t-cells we've got um, helper t-cells we've got suppressor t-cells um, and we've got memory t-cells so these are helper t-cells <laughs> helper t-cells as the name suggests these are the guys these are the nice guys of the group they go help, they go and help other white blood cells that are involved in the process um, and they secrete cytokines to help coordinate the immune response then we have the cytotoxic killer T cells. These are the T cells that destruct and release. They release cytokines uh, to kill the um, pathogens by triggering apoptosis, by triggering cell death. They kill the cells that have been infected so that they can get rid of the, um, the pathogen. The suppressor T cells, think of them as like the best friend of the killer T cells. These are the ones that will then go ahead and control the immune response and they'll control the immune response by suppressing the killer T cells that kind of want to go on a rampage. So that's what the suppressor T cells will do. And finally, we have the uh, memory T cells. They're going to again remember what the antibodies were. Um, <coughs> they're going to remember what the antibodies were, and then as a result, they're going to remain in circulation. <laughs> To allow for quick response and a stronger response upon reinfection and so that's why you'll see and you'll get questions where i ask you you know what is the difference between the first so, sorry between primary and secondary exposure so always remember primary exposure where can i draw okay prime uh there's gonna be okay just don't worry about this diagram for a second i oh, know i've got it on the slide after this never mind so i won't draw uh will save you from my drawing but essentially primary exposure is going to be less stronger than the secondary exposure and we'll have a look at what that means in one second but let's have a look at what's actually happening now what the whole process is let's put it all together so there is a pathogen you have been infected with something let's say a flu virus your sister was sick a couple of days ago and you chose to hang out around her um and so you got sick as well all right not that it's a personal story but it is um all right so you got sick as well and you should not have hung around her but you chose to because she was sick and you wanted to make her feel better but nonetheless um so you got sick and now you're sick with a viral flu 
and you're coughing and sneezing and all of that. So there's a pathogen in your body. It has an antigen on it. An antigen is like a marker that shows your immune system that, hey, um, and it's a way for your immune system to recognize that this is not a cell that belongs in my body. Like it's come from outside. So that's like a strong red flag that we don't want that. Uh, so the pathogen, what will happen is our amazing heroic macrophages are going to go ahead and engulf the pathogen. They're going to eat the pathogen. Remember, these are white blood cells. It's sort of their role. They're going to go ahead and deal with this head on. So they're going to go ahead and eat the pathogen. And now once they eat the pathogen, macrophages have something called MHC class 2 presenters. Now your body has um, MHC complexes. Class 1 is present on all body cells. And it's basically a way for your body to show that, um, like for example, the proteins that it displays on its surface to show your immune cells that we are self cells. Um, macrophages have MHC class 2 presenters. And so once the macrophage has eaten a pathogen, it is going to display the antigens on its surface to show the body that, hey, we've got something entering our body and this is what it looks like. This is the antigen. This is the marker for it. Uh, and so once that happens... We're going to have these cells called interleukins that go ahead and they're going to call help B and T cells to the site of function. So, and once they've done that, now our um, helper B and T cells are down and ready to go. So, what that means is this. Once they're ready, uh, and, they're, and B cells are going to be part of the uh, antibody-mediated immunity, and Helper T cells are the cell mediated immunity. So what happens is once the B and the T cells are there, essentially um, the helper T cells are going to come and they are going to try out different antibodies until they find the right antibody for the antigen. Same thing with the B cells. Once they find the right antibodies, they're going to go ahead. B cells are going to differentiate into plasma B cells and uh, memory B cells. Plasma B cells are going to secrete lots and lots of antibodies to immobilize the pathogen. So they're going to go ahead and immobilize the pathogen like that. And once they immobilize the pathogen and they like the antibodies go ahead and stick to the antigen, the killer T cells come and they kill these off because they now see that essentially these are the things that are, you know, um, that are causing that like that's basically causing the disease. So these are pathogens. These are foreign invaders. We don't want that. So they come ahead. And so they are going to secrete perforin, which is like a chemical to destroy off the pathogen at the same time. The memory B cells are going to remember what antibody worked for this specific type of antigen and they're going to store it in the lymph nodes. Hopper T cells are sort of doing the same thing. They're going to come ahead. They've found the antibody. They're now going to send cytokines. So it's called cytokine signaling. They're going to signal cytokines to go ahead and then they're going to call killer T cells to the spot. They're going to call suppressor T cells because um, wherever killer T cells go, they need suppressor T cells. Otherwise, killer T cells can go on a little rampage. Um, and then you've got memory T cells, which are also going to store the antibody in the lymph nodes. So here killer T cells and then we've got suppressor T cells and what happens is they suppresses killer T cells once the immune response is finished and we've discussed that and after a while we've dealt with the pathogen and most importantly our memory cells re remember the antibody that was needed for it and that's so important so that's done and we have dealt with the pathogen so that was immunity if you have any questions please ask again it was a little review into it um if you have any specific questions like i said don't be afraid to ask and definitely make sure that you've got detailed notes of these processes because it's really important uh, Alrighty, let's have a look at this last stop point about prevention and control but before we do that uh, let's have a look at this diagram that I've been sort of trying to explain with my hands the, the whole time. So, um, this is basically how vaccines work now. What vaccines do are essentially within vaccines, we add in, um, we add in an uh, attenuated dead or synthetic viral particles of a specific pathogen into the vaccine right and then we do that so that we can have a primary immune response so it's not the actual pathogen so you're not like 
sick as such but you that's why you know you experience symptoms that are specific to the disease so like um you know coughing and so on or be having a fever or being sick or being tired is because we are trying to induce that same response um so when you get that first vaccination or infection after a couple of days your antibody count goes up because your body has found a way to deal with it so what that means is that the next time round when you actually get the pathogen when you're actually infected your antibody count will shoot up it the response will be faster right so as soon as we get the you can see here that here um it took us what uh, when you initially get the vaccine like up to like 25 days i would say right there or yeah the peak yeah 25 days before you actually peaked and you got that high antibody concentration response in comparison to the second time round where it took just about there that's the sort of the high there about like 20 days as well so less time but a lot higher antibody response very very high immediately just a couple of days afterwards the response was so much higher than it had ever been the first time around so that's how vaccines work so that they, you uh, so that when you actually get the um the the pathogen where you actually come in contact with it your secondary antibody response can be really fast and so you don't get as sick <laughs> So when it comes to um, <coughs> prevention, treatment and control, uh, some really important things include hygiene practices. So washing your hands, um, coughing when like, you know, putting an elbow when you're coughing or sneezing and not like, you know, just sneezing normally. Um, that was high and you'd and you'd remember this from COVID nineteen. So hygiene practices and quarantine was quarantining, not going outside. If you're sick, stay home. And even generally we had everyone quarantine um so that there's you know no no exchange of pathogens there. Uh vaccination was very important and it was part of the public health program. Pe pesticides comes in uh like pesticides for example obviously weren't used for COVID because you know <laughs> it's a viral so not used for COVID however pesticides for example really um they were a key part of the response for example for malaria spraying pesticides huge and genetic engineering so genetic engineering is something that is um, still sort of um, in progress as a process and so this is where we are engineering resistance to pathogens so to plants animals vectors humans um, and there's been research into like uh, engineering Anopheles mosquitoes that spread malaria um, and engineering so that they don't have I th I th I th And I cannot remember I think it's like they're like red eyes or something I, I remember the image that that was in that article it was like a close-up of a mosquito with red eyes It's it a bit scary um, No, but it was basically how they were going to engineer these mosquitoes so that they cannot carry the protozoa anymore um and so, and so basically that's to modify those genes so that they can stop that, um, you know, the spread of the disease because vectors, that's the way it's spread and it's huge, it's a huge issue worldwide um, as well. Okay, we're going well according to time. So let's have a look now at a last process of, sorry, our last module. <coughs> module eight so we're looking at non-infectious diseases and we're going to focus on homeostasis epidemiology and tech and disorders so homeostasis um there are two homeostasis mechanisms that you have to know according to the syllabus uh, and that's your uh temperature um and glucose so I won't do the temperature one because I think that one's pretty pretty obvious. You know what happens when your body temperature goes high. You start sweating. Your blood vessels dilate. Uh, same thing happens. Oh, well, the opposite happens when you when your body temperature decreases. You start to shiver. Your blood vessels constrict so that you don't lose heat uh, by blood and so on. So, essentially, that's the temperature homeostasis. So, hopefully, you 
are familiar with that. The one that I'm going to focus on, because it has a lot more going on, is the glucose homeostasis. So there are two, um, okay, there are two parts to it, and we're going to start off, let's start off with homeostasis so normal normal blood glucose level um here it says it's 90 milligrams per 100 mils um i you can also remember it as like 45 millimolar of uh, that's perfectly fine like five mil four yeah 45 millimolar anything below four is when you um have to get like when yeah it's not good so what happens is let's say your blood glucose level rises right your blood glucose level rises you've just had a meal um you had pizza and soft drink for lunch and um i want to think about pizza because i've got a sore throat and i cannot eat uh but let's say <laughs> you, you've had pizza uh, um so you've had a pizza you've had a soft drink and you're and you know it's very high in carbs cheese fat so on um soft drink very high in sugar and your blood glucose level has shot up to eight to ten millimolar that's what usually happens after a meal it shoots up so once that has happened what we see is that um, your insulin secreting cells of the pancreas, um, your iron cells in the pancreas, uh, beta cells, what they do is that um, they start to release insulin. And insulin is a hormone that is responsible for actually bringing your blood glucose level back down so what insulin does is that once it's been released it goes ahead and it signals mainly the liver but also the muscle sometimes but mainly the first place it will go to that is the liver and it would say take up some glu uh, glucose from the body we've just got a lot of glucose it's not good you know it can really affect um and the reason high glucose is not good is because it can affect cell function it's just not good overall over a long period of time it can affect like um other other functions of the body as well and it can have huge impacts on for example the heart um and function of the heart and also like your respiratory system so that's why high blood glucose level is something that we don't want to have and that's what doctors you know always suggest against um so <clears throat> Insulin has left the pancreas. It's been secreted by the pancreas. It goes to the liver. It says, "Hey, take up some uh, take up some glucose and store it as glycogen." Glycogen is basically like a molecule that has like ten to twelve glucose attached to it. So that's it's kind of like think of it like as a yeah, it, it's like basically like oh, what am I pressing? Um, yeah, like it's. So it's got G, it's got glenin in the middle and then it's just got glucose attached to it in like in a tree formation so each one each part like branch is a glucose molecule so that's that's what basically um glycogen is it's basically like a huge store of glucose so every molecule has like 10 to 12 um molecules of glucose attached to it so what happens is essentially that um once your um yeah insulin goes it tells the liver to take up glucose um and store it as glycogen and then blood glucose levels go down to that 45 millimole over a period of time um, it can also ask the body cells to take up glucose as well and so we come back to our key sort of you know four to five millimolar levels of glucose um however then let's say that you haven't had a meal in like three hours all right you haven't had a meal you haven't had anything to eat so immediately your blood glucose levels down so then this time around your pancreas are going to secrete the alpha cells in your pancreas are going to secrete glucagon and glucagon um is essentially going to go and s go to the liver and say hey you know sorry you know all the glycogen you had um you've got to break it down into glucose and send it throughout the body and once it does that because your body needs glucose your cells need glucose your brain needs glucose a lot your brain uses a lot of glucose so it's saying go ahead go circulate glucose to the body um and then the glucose goes ahead and as a result your blood glucose levels rise to that set point again <laughs> So this is really important um, in understanding how we come back to the uh, equilibrium level. So like this is about knowing that regardless of the external conditions, your internal um, 
environment has to stay in a certain state and that's what the glucose homeostasis is about so the key organs here are the pancreas which detect glucose levels and the secrete hormones insulin is secreted when glucose levels are low and it's secreted by the beta cells um, glucagon is secreted by the alpha cells in the pancreas liver stores glucose as glycogen and then it also releases that glycogen and other tissues are uh, it cells they use up glucose um and so that's that and then finally we've got hormones so glucagon is our low blood glucose hormone it's saying that hey you've got to release some glucose now insulin is high blood glucose something that um and this is something that you also sort of look at when we look at um type 1 diabetes uh in this module you don't quite study it as such but you look at you know how it's high prevalence and so on all right, so you look at its high prevalence, and the reason why um, type 2 diabetes, because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and so that's because um, in type 1 diabetes, your body's, uh, your immune cells start to attack your um, beta cells, and so they start to, in start to attack the in insulin producing cells, the insulin secreting cells rather, and as a result, um, like as a result you can't produce that insulin so you can't control your uh blood glucose levels what happens with um what happens with type 2 diabetes is that over time if you keep having sort of um unhealthy meals and you keep having unhealthy meals um and your you know and your body sort of especially as you get older and your body has to release more and more insulin to deal with that to bring your you know like the glucose level back to normal over time your body and your um your body can become resistant to insulin and it goes from slowly insulin resistance to then like not reacting at all to insulin and then that's type 2 diabetes and that's why uh, they say you know exercise and healthy eating is like key to controlling type 2 diabetes especially when you're sort of showing signs of it um at the beginning so that's the glucose homeostasis okay let's move on then um i cannot find my cursor give me one second where is it there we go okay so epidemiology let's have a look at epidemiology so let's consider what makes a good or a valid or a valid epidemiological study so your goal is to always design a study where you're going to generate a lot of data to conclusively test your aim so you can be given like a study in a question um and they can ask you like is it eva evaluate the validity of the study or something so always remember that a good study should have a large cohort or a sample size right it should have a broad cohort as well so you can't have the same sort of type of people um if you are testing let's say if you're testing um heart and this is a very random study and very broad but let's say you're testing heart conditions and lack of exercise in um in individuals like the relationship between heart conditions and exercise and you're just testing young people you're not going to actually get much because it's like young people are not that they obviously exercise a bit more um and also heart conditions generally like you older people are generally susceptible to it so you want a broad cohort you know in that older people category which includes broad you know like um that people coming from a diverse range of environment ethnicity exposure to possible causes as well um you also want to conduct relevant background medical checks for participants and create a comprehensive questionnaire um, and peer review prior to publication. So good studies are peer reviewed. So essentially collect enough information so you can see effect of different variables. And this checklist is really good. So committed to memory, you'll need it and use this to evaluate different studies as well. Okay, analyzing patterns. So here we'll have a look at um when it comes to analyzing patterns in epidemiological study we consider things like what is the difference in incidence between different countries what is the difference between different um incidents between genders age groups lifestyles occupations and that is used to um draw conclusions okay last part of module a technology and disorders so <coughs> 
let's have a look at this. So, when it comes to eye disorders, we are looking at, firstly, this is what a normal eye looks like. I won't go through the structure of an eye, but I'm just going to show you, yeah, well, I mean, that, that is the structure of an eye. So, we've got a normal eye here. This is the focal plane. So, the focal plane is at the back of the retina there where the light hits the back just where your cons and where your cones and rods are that uh and they are the and they are the ones that are responsible for uh change like uh changing the image into sensory signals which are then sent to your brain right so that's the focal plane in a normal eye in a myopic eye so myopia is nearsightedness it's when you can see things close to you perfectly well but things far away are blurry so this is where you uh this happens when the cornea is too curved so the cornea here you can see here it's like uh longer less curved here it's too curved and because the cornea is too curved what happens is that the light doesn't go all the way back so the cornea he is too curved so light does not go all the way back it should be hitting this is where the focal plane should be this is the light should be hitting all the way back here but because it's only hitting the middle of the eye here we can't see objects that are far away hyperopia is when the focal plane is actually behind the retina and because now it's behind the retina we cannot see this is called farsightedness we can see things that are far away very clearly we can see them very clearly. However, things that are closer to us, we can't see them very clearly because of this idea here of the focal plane being far too back. And so that is the difference between myopia and hyperopia. So causes are in myopia, the cornea is too curved so the image doesn't go all the way back it hits most of the front hyperopia is in the cornea is too flat so the eye is, it's too flat so it goes uh all the way back um and so it could be if the eyeball is too long or if the eyeball is too short so to um correct that generally we wear glasses so myopia is when people wear uh, to help with myopia nearsightedness people wear concave glasses so so that so that's like to help the image go further back so to help the focal plane move further back so it's like flatter glasses um hyperopia because the cornea are too flat with our glasses they're convex so that the image can not so that image does not travel behind the focal plane so it hits like behind the retina so that's that now if you want to have eye, laser eye surgery done because of that uh laser eye surgery would involve rectifying the cornea shape so flattening the cornea because it's too curved or increasing the curve of the cornea because it's too flat and that's myopia and hyperopia now the e so with the e um the e is divided into three parts we've got the outer e and the outer e includes the pinna the ear canal so we've got the the pinna the ear canal um and this is how sound waves enter the ear canal uh so that's the outer e the middle e is where we've got the eardrums We've got these, we've got the eardrums here, um, and we've got the um, ossicles. So this bit here is the, that's the ossicles, and I'm going to rub that off so you can actually see what they look like. There you go, that's the ossicles right there. Um, and so that's the middle ear. And now what happens in the middle ear is that um, the, when the, air wave so when the sound waves come through sorry sound waves come through they vibrate against the eardrum and when they vibrate against the eardrum um when they vibrate against the eardrum it beats against the ossicle and um it moves the ossicle bone and so the ossicle bone will kind of it, it's kind of like open close in a way but it will kind of open up and close and beat against the cochlea here it'll beat against the cochlea over here so you've got the eardrum you've got the ossicles you've got the cochlea there uh, the cochlea here and so the ossicle will beat against the cochlea here um and then the inner ear includes the um semicircular canals it includes the cochlea and it includes the auditory nerve 
So what happens is, once the ossicles beat against the cochlea, the cochlea have, um, it, it, the, they've got a fluid in there, and they also have little hair um, that line the cochlea. And it's the little hair that are actually responsible for changing the frequency of, so for understanding the frequency of different sounds. For uh, Not understanding, what's the word? For converting the frequency of different sounds into like, um, electrical waves so the cochlea actually does the conversion of the um, sound waves into electrical impulses and then those electrical impulses are sent to the brain via the auditory nerve here so you can see how the um, cochlea is connected to the uh, auditory nerve there so that's that so that's how hearing works so to um, rectify disorders of the ear we've got three different technologies now you need to remember which technology would suit in which case um conductive hearing loss for conductive hearing loss essentially we've got um conductive hearing loss is when it's affecting the uh, the inner sorry the outer and the middle ear so hearing aids work for conductive hearing loss because what they do is that they magnify the sound vibrations that are entering the ear they increase hearing sensitivity and they can be worn um, inside the ear or behind the ear so they basically magnify the sound vibrations so they go all the way through so here they are um, bone conduction implants they can be used for conductive hearing loss so outer or middle ear or also for mixed hearing loss which is mixed um, so what that means is so mixed hearing loss sorry is both um, outer and inner so what that means is the sound waves are detected by the processor there's a processor that detects the sound waves and it actually converts the sound waves digitally into vibrations and then it sends the vibrations to the implanted section of the device and that stimulates vibration of the e bone so that's what the bone conduction implants during finally cochlear implants now cochlear implants this is for sense in your hearing loss so this is for the inner ear damage and now this is um basically replacing the function of the cochlea so what happens is that you've got sound which is received by an external transmitter and it's turned into a uh, digital code and it is converted to electrical impulses so you've got the microphone it picks up the voice or, or the sound right and there's also a speech processor so the speech processor actually processes that um and it changes the and it turns the um the transmitter turns uh, sorry the speech processor turns the sound into a uh, into a code and then through that it transfers um so it turns it into a code it turns it into electrical impulses and then it transfers that specifically as you can see here the implant on the inside of the head uh, on the inside of the the e here it goes straight through to the auditory nerve to the cochlea that is what's happening here so we're not so this is where because the inner ear is damaged the cochlea is not working so we have to somehow get the um get the sound the vibrations like we change them into electrical impulses and get those electrical impulses from the implant to the auditory nerve and so you can see how the um implant inside the head here is connected to the auditory nerve or to the cochlea and then here to the auditory nerve and going straight through okay so finally the kidneys um so we now remember the structure of the kidneys so these are the medulla you've got the cortex you've got um the renal pelvis here this is the renal artery and this is the renal vein um <coughs> <coughs> And so, and then you've got the ureter, which connects down to the urethra and the bladder. So there are two disorders uh, with kidneys. And this is showing you what a nephron looks like. So there are nephrons here within the cortex and the medulla. And this is what a nephron looks like. This is where the filtration happens. So we've got the uh, glomerulus right here within the blood, within a within the bowman's capsule you've got the glomerulus and this is how the blood uh the filter the filtrate comes through um and so it comes in goes through the proximal tube down the loop of henley's there's the ascending and descending and ascending loop of henley up through the distal tube and in the collecting duct uh, in the collecting duct so 
the two disorders of the kidneys are first uh, is the polycystic kidney disorder which is a genetic disorder which causes growth of fluid filled cysts in the kidney um and then we've got chronic kidney disease which is the gradual loss of kidney function over time so the technology that um we use for kidney um that can be used for to like I guess manage kidney disease uh, is hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis but the only way to like um, manage it long term is to get a kidney transplant so dialysis is basically removing the metabolic base the salt and the extra water from the body which you'll you know the kidneys do internally it's doing that um, externally by allowing dissolved solute to pass through a semi-permeable membrane so what happens with hemodialysis is we take the blood it's pumped through this um this machine here and basically as it goes through um through osmotic pressure we're taking out the vase here um we use this is the used dialysis fluid and we have set and fresh um and like fresh dialysis fluid is being sent into the machine and so we're taking out the waste um and through that we are clearing the blood off the metabolic base and sending it back through into the body uh, peritoneal dialysis does this inside the body so so hemodialysis is essentially um hemodialysis like to have hemodialysis done you have to go to a hospital um and you know use the machines there and it's definitely very um time and cost and energy expensive peritoneal dialysis is works in the same way but it's actually working within the um abdominal cavity in the lining of the stomach so the peritoneum um and so what is we've got a dialysis solution we use a catheter to um have that process of filtration done within the body uh, but the essentially the key here is that you can talk about these processes they are effective but they're obviously not as effective as um, the you know what the actual kidney does um, and they're definitely very time expensive very costly and very um, energy expensive as well so yes yeah, so you want to think of those points when you are writing responses and you're commenting on the effectiveness of these um of these machines and these processes but remember yeah the um with kidney disease the long-term man management is a kidney transplant so you do this until you can get a kidney transplant Alrighty, so look at us go <coughs> all righty so we have gone through the syllabus we've gone through the main parts of the syllabus now if you have any questions please please ask um the live chat always closes a couple of minutes after the lecture finishes so please ask any questions that you have but let's have a look at how you can now prepare for the final exam so my key tips would be firstly practice papers now is the time to extend yourself redo the questions that you struggle with don't just do it and leave it in there mark these questions really really important mark these questions um then refine your uh your notes so this is where focus on key terms like make sure you have all the necessary examples um and use these in your practice but the thing is don't i would recommend if you are <coughs> <coughs> Now, if you're coming towards the last, you know, this sort of tail end of the, um, the, <laughs> the exam, you know, like prep period, um, I would recommend to focus more so on practice papers than refining your notes. Like, make sure you have all the relevant notes, but like, don't spend time sitting down trying to make them pretty and like really succinct and whatnot. Do practice papers instead. So if you're choosing now between refining notes and practice papers, practice papers are the way to go but make sure you've got like really um important is that you've got all the necessary examples then write or plan long response <coughs> and write or plan long response questions so that is basically really important you want to write clear example responses to all long questions um it's a really good exercise and it makes you feel really confident um, and you can access <coughs> oh, goodness okay and you can access um, 
lots of questions if you search up NESA additional sample examination materials. So that's basically um, when the new syllabus change came, NESA posted this like 80 page document that has all these practice questions um, that are like labeled according to different bands and um, modules. So access that. <coughs> It is really, really good. Um, now, practice analyzing questions and planning responses. Focus on implementing the key terms and contents. Focus on structure. Focus on um, yeah. Focus on structure. Focus on like answering like a verb. So like write as much as needed. Really, really important. Use examples. Um, use. <coughs> use key terms um what else was i going to say and also make sure when you do the additional sample question material um you also practice um th there's a lot of like graph questions as well so remember nessa is big on skills they're going to give you graphs they're going to ask you to interpret data so make sure that you feel comfortable doing that okay tips uh, <coughs> okay tips so and there's a video for you to have a look at to have a um which discusses exam strategy so you know just to um help you guys choose an exam strategy if you are not sure of how you approach the exam um yeah i personally yeah i just did it back to front but like the thing i always do is that if you don't get something leave it come back to it really important you do that even if you feel like you have no idea what you're doing <coughs> okay even if you have no idea what you are doing, leave it, come back to, you'll know somehow. That's just how the brain works. It's really cool. So just so just leave it, come back to it. Don't get caught up in questions you can't ask. Uh, sorry, you can't answer. Um, plan all your responses, even shorter ones, and especially, especially the long ones. Plan them out. Uh, identify the syllabus area. Use key terminology. Uh, identify harder questions so definitely make sure you spend time like extra time on this harder you know seven six eight mark questions there was a nine marker in the 2020 paper 2021 paper sorry scientific drawings clear lines do not shade in between no label uh, no shading uh, and no shading but label um that's really important and then finally graphs punnett squares pedigrees always keep it simple keep it neat um and give them a key as well uh, always include a key especially for punnett squares and pedigrees and also for graphs if you're using different symbols um and once you finish the answer go back reread the question did you actually answer it so a key um a tip that we like to use here like to do practice questions at tutes but for example in my class is like two minutes per mark kind of thing and that's just calculated like on 180 divided by 100 which gives you um 180 marks divided by a uh, hundred so it gives you about 1.8 minutes and so we just sort of go like two minutes um essentially per mark so yeah look that is something that you can use if you like um or you can find your own little trick that works for you but the two minute per mark thing just gives you about you know 20 second per mark to the like add into your account and then you can come back and read the paper again or you know read a question again or spend extra time on a question but see what works for you go in with a plan go in how you're going to attack the question don't just yeah don't just sort of be like okay i'll see how it works in the day and this is where doing past papers beforehand really helps because you've done them beforehand you know exactly what works for you and that's exactly how it should be you should know what works for you um so that's that for your checklist make sure you have an interest sentence plus a judgment sentence define the key terms name examples um, make sure you answer the question really important and have a concluding sentence so this is generally for all of your responses but for long answer responses read and carefully underline all key terms make sure you identify the syllabus area as well and then plan a structure do not uh, remember you want to spend even if it takes you one two three minutes to plan and structure before you start writing you wouldn't do that instead of jumping straight into writing so plan a structure make sure you have a strong introduction and conclusion use diagrams tables flowcharts if you have time 
Um, and then don't be afraid of subheadings as well. Like you can use subheadings if it helps. And finally, reread the question after every paragraph. Structure is so important in bio, so important. So make sure that you actually plan it out. Kind of plan it out like a little essay so that you're covering every single thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking if there's anything else I've missed. No, look, um, hopefully I've answered any questions. But now in these next couple of days, if you are... Again, if you're struggling between uh, choosing to either rewrite and make your notes more succinct or doing practice questions, do practice questions. Um, even if you know on days where it doesn't feel, where you can't, don't feel like, and, and you will have those days. Everyone has those days. Even if it's close to the HSE, your body doesn't know that. It's stressed. It's going to need those days. So even if you cannot sit there for three hours and do the whole paper, do one question. Do two questions. Do half an hour worth of questions and then leave it. But do something. Do a little. Do a little every day. Um, that that can be really helpful. Uh, what else? Um, yeah. If you're struggling between rewriting your notes and practice questions, always practice questions. But if there are parts of the syllabus that you don't have notes on it that you're not like familiar with, definitely do those first. One key thing that really worked for me with STEM subjects was like using a traffic light system. So that's basically when you look at your syllabus and you highlight things red green or yellow red is where you have no idea what you're going to write for it if you get a question on that topic more than likely you would not you would probably not be getting any marks <laughs> yellow is when you know you've got some idea you'll be able to write some things but not everything so you may scrape a couple of marks green is like I know this topic really well. I wish the whole question was about this. The whole paper was about this specific topic. So choose, uh, so go through the syllabus and highlight each point, red, green, or yellow. Now, don't um, underestimate yourself and do everything red. And I say that from experience because I did that. And then I realized, oh, that's not very good. And then I realized I was being a bit tough on myself. So do not be tough on yourself think through it like there will definitely be green areas but there definitely be red areas and that's okay so do that and then prioritize your learning according to that do practice papers but yeah look that's it from me today thank you guys for tuning in good luck you got this you're gonna smash it out look after yourselves enjoy this it's gonna be over soon and you're gonna have a lovely amazing time after that so take care you guys are gonna smash it good luck and i will see